Welcome to a live episode of Houston, We Have a Podcast. We are getting in front of the cameras today because if you haven't heard, NASA is accepting applications to become an astronaut all throughout the month of March. So we have got a lot of questions and we have great guests here that are going to be answering them for you live. Make sure you follow along with us on Facebook and Twitter and wherever else. We got, we'll got. we be getting to your questions here in a second, but I'd like to first introduce our very special guest, starting with Ann Romer. Ann, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. You are the manager of the Astronaut Selection Office, you know, the ins and outs of the application process, uh, for, and you're there from the inside. In fact, you came on the podcast, you actually helped us kick it off with episode two I to do. talk about when we brought on the Astronaut 2017 class. I remember that very well. <laughs> well, welcome back. Thank you. I'm curious to hear the insides of this. Thanks. We Glad also have here. Kayla Barron. Hey, Kaylin. Hi. Ka <laughs> Karen. <laughs> Kayla. Uh, Kayla, you're among the turtles, the astronaut class of 2017. Yeah. You went through this application process and competed against 18,000 other people and you're here and as part of the Turtles. You have a bachelor's in systems engineering with a, from the US Naval Academy and a master's in nuclear engineering from Cambridge. You're a marine warfare officer and you just graduated two months ago. Congratulations. Thank you. How's, uh, how's life been after graduation? It's been awesome. We've been really busy doing lots of different jobs now that we've graduated, still in training as well. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun to contribute to the office in a different way. Wonderful. Okay, well, I have a lot of questions, but we also have, are going to be taking questions live from you, from the viewer, and we have uh, Jennifer Hernandez standing by. Hey, Jennifer. Hey there, Gary. Hey, Kayla. Hey, Ann. Jennifer works with us in our uh, public affairs office. She's also a fellow Penn Stater. We are. Penn State. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we're going to be taking <laughs> questions live. The Ohio is rolling her eyes. <laughs> Well, the fellow Penn Stater is going to be taking uh, questions. I don't know about that. Yeah, we'll see. No. Um, uh, from, from the web, uh, Jennifer, do we have any questions to start us off? We sure do. We have one from Twitter, from Celery. What do you have to do to stand out from all the other applicants? Oh, that's a good question. I think, I think that question is to me. Yeah. Unless, yeah, no, I'm just teasing. Um, right, so we, we are looking for a lot of information on the resume that folks fill out. Um, so I would start by saying, right, we want people to be very detailed as they describe their work experience and other experiences. We also give applicants an opportunity to describe hobbies and interests that they have. Um, and we encourage applicants to put as much information there as possible as well. When you're reviewing 18,000 applications, sometimes it's the weird stuff that stands out, honestly, an interesting hobby or an interesting project at work that, right, an applicant may think, oh, that's just what I do. Um, and so really we're looking for them to give us as much information as possible. Um, okay. So that's a starting point. That's a starting point for yep. standing out. Let's yep. get into the details of what you need just in the first place, right? Okay. So what's yep. the, let's start from the very minimum requirements. What are you looking for as, as a minimum requirement to sure. become a NASA astronaut? The minimum requirements are pretty straightforward, Gary. Uh, we are, we require a master's degree, and that's actually something that's new this year. Um, we have always stated in our application process that, that advanced degrees are preferred. This is just trying to be a little bit more overt in what we're looking for and that most, the majority of astronauts hired have had a master's degree or beyond, mm. um, or test pilot school. They also, uh, beyond the degree, have to have at least two years of professional experience. And then uh, being a U.S. government agency, we also require uh, U.S. citizenship. Ah, very important. Yep. Okay, so yeah, master's degree, I guess you had to deal with the 18,000 applications last time, right? But it turns out, I guess this 2017 class had a lot of masters anyway. Is that is it sort yeah. of just narrowing in on what yeah. you already know that you're looking for? Yeah, okay. and right, the, the announcement, I encourage applicants to, to review the announcement online. It's got a lot of specifics. Um, that, that can count towards, right, if they're in a PhD program and have a certain number of hours, that can count towards a master's degree, et cetera. So uh, read the announcement. Uh, it's got all the information that folks need to know whether they're qualified yeah. or not. Um, now, this might be a stupid question, but STEM, 
Now, you know, we always talk about STEM, science, Thank technology, you. engineering, math. Why science, technology, engineering, math? I'm a marketing major. I want to go to space. Why can't I go? <laughs> I've heard that from a lot of people lately. <laughs> um, right. The, the core component of what we're asking folks to do and to train, and Kayla can probably speak to this as mm. well, um, right, there's a technical technological component of that. Um, and so m a lot of the jobs at NASA require that STEM background. So. Okay. Yeah. You're, it's, it's ultimately. It's important. Well, how has it helped you, Kayla, with just some of your astronaut candidate training, having that STEM background? How has it helped you in just the first few years of training? Um, that's a really good question. I think in our training, we're really generalists. We're asked to understand and be able, be able to operate in a lot of different contexts, whether that's learning how to operate systems on the space station or fly mm -hmm. a T-38 or even work in mission control. <laughs> um, and so I think having a tech you know, a STEM background of some kind helps give you sort of the baseline skills you need to understand those things, because a lot gets thrown at you really fast. Um, so having a foundation that even though people come from a lot of different areas, whether that's geology, microbiology, engineering, aviation, different parts of the military, medicine, uh, it kind of gives you a starting point to approach a lot of those problems. Yeah, that's huge, because you don't, you're, you have to train on so many different areas, right? So having a baseline to be able to tackle all of these different problems, STEM is probably one of the best ways to do that. Very interesting. Uh, so you talked about related experiences, Anne. So yes. um, I'm assuming it has to deal with the related experience of what you have a degree in. Yeah, right, and there's okay. some there's some flexibility. For example, though, right, finishing uh, your degree and your master's degree and going and working as a ski instructor, although fun and wonderful, uh, wouldn't, we wouldn't count that towards the two-year professional experience. So it would mm. need to be in a discipline, ideally equated with the degree. We see, right, some of the more general physics is an example. You can get a degree in physics and do a lot of different things. So we're looking for that technology experience, that that technological experience beyond the degree. Beyond the degree, okay. Yeah. Now, what if you're a pilot? Is there a little bit different sure. scenario there? Pilots, um, you know, and it's interesting, we still use, and Kayla, I'm sure we'll talk about this as well, we still use mm -hmm. the T-38 as a training vehicle, and so we do still have pilot astronauts mm -hmm. in the astronaut office. Um, if applying to, as a pilot, uh, folks need to have a minimum of 1,000 hours of pilot in command type pilot in command hours uh, in a high performance jet aircraft. Okay, and Kayla, I'm guessing, now you were not a pilot, you have en various engineering degrees, but you're mm -hmm. training in the T-38 anyway. Yeah, so we, our class has a number of pilots, but also a number of people from different backgrounds. My background is in the submarine force in the Navy. Um, so after graduating from my master's program, I went through the Navy's nuclear power training and then worked in a very operational context aboard submarines deploying in the Pacific. Um, so that was kind of applying engineering. That's how I got my you know, years of professional experience that Anne is talking about. Um, but when we come here, even if you're not a pilot, you learn how to fly. So we trained to fly in the back seat of the T-38, originally in a role kind of doing communications and navigation. But once we get qualified, we also help fly the jet too. So hmm. we use it as an opportunity to train with other crewmates, other astronauts, to learn how to communicate when you're in a high-risk environment, operating real machinery, make decisions when things aren't going according to plan, and things like that. See, I feel like this communication aspect has got to be a big part of being an astronaut, because what we're talking about now is we're, when we're talking about this new class of astronauts, mm -hmm. and we can actually bring up the, the application here in a second, but we're talking about this Artemis generation. You're talking about people who are going to be going to different planets and have to live together for a long period of time. They have mm -hmm. to coexist. So getting along with your crewmates has got to be pretty important. Do you find that in the turtles, or do you guys get along with each other? Yeah, we get along <laughs> really great. Uh, I think graduation was really fun for us as a group because it was just a huge accomplishment for us as a team. Yeah. I mean, you get here and you start training, and a lot is being asked of you. And most of our evaluations are really about our individual skills and performance. You're kind of in the hot seat alone. But mm -hmm. we chose to approach our training as a team and wanted everybody to get to the finish line together. Um, and that made a huge difference for us because everybody had something that they were really naturally good at and everyone also on the other side had something that was harder for them than they might have expected. And so having the support of your peers made all of the difference in the world. 
Wow. And we also do specific training geared towards getting to know each other and become good teammates. Uh, we do things like we went on a backpacking course with Knowles in the Canyonlands in Utah. Um, that was really fun. We also incorporate that kind of training whenever we're doing um, other kinds of training as well. So we get that kind of training in the neutral buoyancy lab when you're working with a teammate, uh, practicing spacewalk skills or things like our geology training where we go out in the field and try to learn about the geology of our planet so that we can apply that in future exploration. But a lot of that is about working as a team, doing that in a group and taking advantage of everybody's skill sets to accomplish a mission. I really want to go into what it's like just these first couple years, but first I want to take a look at the application and see what people can actually do. So mm -hmm. in order to uh, go to apply to be an astronaut, thank you Jennifer for taking us here. We're going to take a look at USA Jobs. Uh, if you're looking to apply to become an astronaut, I would assume you would just search the title astronaut. There it is. Astronaut candidate, okay, because you're you're a candidate for the first couple of years. Okay, so you mm -hmm. would go there, you would click on Linda B. Johnson Space Center, that's where we are today. And uh, here you go, this is the application process. And, and actually, I've gone through this a couple times, it's, it's pretty dense, there's a lot to it, a lot of different responsibilities. My favorite, though, is that one right there, extensive travel required. <laughs> Kayla, I'm sure you're gonna have to go many different places all over the world, outside of the world. That's gonna be an expectation of being a NASA astronaut. Let's see, specialized, okay, here's a good section right here, the uh, degree fields, uh, what, when related to sciences, because, okay, here's, that's a good point, because we're talking about STEM, right, we've said that, science, technology, yep. engineering, math, degrees in technology are actually not considered qualifying, that's interesting. Are there, are, but it's, it looks like even some sciences, though, so what, looking at what's not, what you, uh, what's not considered qualifying, what, give me some examples of uh, different engineering, math, sciences, that you're looking for? So, right, I think engineering, we probably see the majority of degrees coming from aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical mm. engineering. Kayla's sitting here next to me with systems, systems engineering and also nuclear engineering. So I think I think the, the majority of engineering disciplines um, we've probably had applications or candidates come from. In the, in the science re arena, right, we have biological science majors, we have the physical science majors, we have, um, we see a lot of applications from medical doctors, uh, and that's an important skill set for the astronaut office to have and continue to have available to us as we look at putting together long duration crews, et cetera. So, um, yeah, most of the degrees that aren't qualifying are listed there. Hmm. Um, you know, as, as curriculums change and majors evolve, if there's ever any doubt, we actually do research the degree program uh, and look at the amount of math and science classes that are required. So if, if there is a questionable degree, we actually do the research and, and make sure that it would be qualifying. Okay. Now, Kayla, what made you want to pursue systems engineering and then nuclear engineering? When you were in school, what were you thinking about? Um, Anne probably knows this from perusing applications, but <laughs> systems engineering means a lot of different things at a lot of different universities. At the Naval Academy, it's actually control systems and robotics engineering. So I was attracted to that major initially because it was super interdisciplinary. I liked electrical engineering, I liked coding, uh, and I liked doing things with an application focus. And so that was a good fit for me because I got to dabble in a lot of different types of engineering and also work on bringing those disciplines together to accomplish something really tangible. And I found that really attractive. Um, and then during my time at the Naval Academy, I got really interested in climate change and new energy technologies that would help us deal with that longer term. And I came to feel that nuclear was a huge part of that uh, future, you know, developing new nuclear generation technologies that had better waste management profiles that were safer and all of these other things. And so that's why I wanted to do that in grad school. So I went and did a research degree helping develop the fuel cycle for a reactor that hopefully we'll build someday soon. See, that's interesting because what you're talking about, you were passionate when you were pursuing systems. You were just passionate about systems engineering. And when you were pursuing nuclear, it was you were just passionate about it. It seems like astronaut wasn't even on your mind at the time. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Yeah. I, a lot of my colleagues wanted to be astronauts from when they were a little kid. And they definitely were making choices to pursue things they were passionate about too, but always with a mind of keeping those doors open for themselves by yeah. studying the right things, maybe joining the military. There's a lot of different tracks to get to these seats. Um, but for me, I was always looked, looking towards challenging myself as much as I could in each subsequent opportunity. So 
astronaut wasn't really a thing in the back of my mind. It was something I always thought was really cool, but didn't really picture myself doing. Mm. Um, and so I actually didn't become inspired to apply until after I had served on a submarine. Um, when I left my submarine, I went back to the Naval Academy to work there, and I got to meet a lot of really interesting people, including a couple of astronauts. Um, and chatting with them, talking about the time when they were building the space station, I found really fascinating because it reminded me a lot of the equipment that we use on submarines. You're also trying to keep people alive in an environment where they shouldn't exist, you know, whether you're hundreds of feet below the surface of the ocean or, you know, hundreds of miles above the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And so that really inspired me because I started thinking of the space station as a submarine in space. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the astronauts who I talked to really encouraged me to keep thinking about that. And once it stuck in my mind, it become, became something that I could actually picture myself doing because I felt the role was so, so similar. Um, and so for me, it was just always about pursuing things I was passionate about. Mm -hmm. And that would be challenging because if I was doing something I liked, even if it was hard, I was going to enjoy it and get the most out of it and find it the most fulfilling. So I think something you see around our office and especially in our classes, everybody who was hired was doing something that they really loved, loved. you know, yeah. that they, they obviously got their dream job by getting the call to come and be an astronaut and they would never trade that for anything. But we all, in some ways, really miss what we were doing before because we were pursuing things we were passionate about. Um, and so I think that's a, a common thread you see across the astronaut office. And I think that's right. Kayla hits upon a point. I think that's one of the best pieces of advice we can give folks and even especially young folks who may still be aspiring to pursue a, a STEM degree, et cetera, is pursue something that you're passionate about and that you enjoy. Um, we receive thousands of applications to be an astronaut, um, right? And obviously only a limited number are, ch are chosen, but um, it really resonates when, when folks get invited in and get come in to interview that they're happy in their jobs and they've liked what they've done and right they've put their heart and soul into it. Yeah, that seems to be a pretty mm -hmm. consistent theme, right? Yeah, so, yeah, very so not much only so. They, do they have the qualifications to become a NASA astronaut, but they were good and they would be happy in this job that they had in the first place because mm -hmm. you're picking the people that are best in their field, right? So, you know, systems engineering, nuclear engineering, you were one of the best in that field with the confined spaces and living in those areas. So yeah, you pull that, but even if you were on, still on the submarine, you would still be happy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we get questions about that a lot. I mean, yeah. People yeah. say, should I major in aerospace engineering or mechanical engineering? And you're like, which one do you like? <laughs> a lot of times um, college students ask me, should I take Russian? I'm like, do you want to learn Russian? Or, you know, they're just trying to see like, do I need to be checking these boxes? And it's like, like Anne was saying, you do have to choose certain fields, there, but there's a broad range yeah. of things you can do. And you just look at our class as an example. We have everything from you know emergency medicine physicians to Mars geologists to microbiologists that study cave slime <laughs> and a bunch of different military roles too. Right. So there's a lot of different paths to get to be a, you know, a competitive applicant for the astronaut office. Now, of course, we're talking about degrees. I think we have a really good question about just physical fitness from the web. Jennifer, do we have a question about physical fitness? Yeah, we sure do. We have one from Twitter from Marie. Okay. Are there particular exercises or fitness regimes a person ought to do if they wish to apply to be an astronaut in the future? Okay, so I guess just, yeah, about, about fitness. Kayla, do you, have, do you have any recommendations on just exercises or fitness? You know, it's really interesting. In, in our office, there are people who are passionate about a whole range of different fitness approaches, whether they like to run or do triathlons or participate more in team sports. A lot of everybody has sort of their own thing they're passionate about doing and have fun doing. And it's important to be fit, of course, and healthy because flying in space does a lot of, puts a lot of stress on your body. Um, but there's no like particular aspect I think that you have to do. I think uh, investing in your own fitness and health is super important, but you can do that a lot of different ways. Okay, yeah, so it's just, uh, once, once again, here's this, this, that same theme, finding something you're passionate about, whether it's cycling, whether it's swimming, whether it's weightlifting, mm -hmm. finding that thing and just having that be a habit for you uh, to, to maintain that fitness consistently throughout your time as an astronaut. Yeah, and we actually have trainers here at NASA who specialize in advising us both when we're in space, but also preparing to go to space and then recovering when we get home. Mm. And that's what they encourage. They say, what do you like to do? What are you going to do consistently? Because that's way better than us prescribing, you know, a very specific, yeah. 
regimen that you're not going to stick to. Yeah. Now, obviously, when you are on the space station, for example, there's only specific equipment, so you, <laughs> you have choice options. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that being said, they believe that you can prepare in a lot of different ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's talk about just coming in, right? You, we, we talked about the application process. We've talked about the minimum applications. Kayla, let's talk about that first time where you got the call that says, hey, we're ready for you to come in. <laughs> we're ready for you to come in and keep interviewing. What was that like, those first those first rounds of interviews? Um, you know, every the time... The best experience of your life, right? Every right time answer. I got a call, whether it was <laughs> from Anne letting me know I was invited for an interview or the final call letting me know I was selected, I kind of always was like, are you are you sure you had the right number? <laughs> you know, it's like very... double-checked. Yeah, yeah. You, the, whole, the whole process is uh, very exciting, but also very intimidating. Mm -hmm. You know, the, there are a lot of impressive people that apply, and the selection panel is made up of really impressive people here at NASA, both in and out of the astronaut office. Um, and for me, especially because it was such a new thing, and I didn't really, you know, chart my course specifically after that, I was always just amazed that they were still interested in, in meeting and talking to me more. Um, <laughs> So I feel really grateful to be there, be here. And every time they called me, I was really grateful that they were giving me, you know, a shot, shot at it for so, sure. So beyond your expertise in your field, and it seems like humility is one of those qualities that's actually a nice thing to have in an astronaut. Uh, yeah, I, right. It is certainly. I think there are a lot of. Um, qualities that go in, right? We're looking for good humans is kind of the phrase mm -hmm. I've been using, right? Good at communicating, good at interpersonal skills and, mm -hmm. and interacting with others, uh, leadership, but also knowing how to follow, right? A lot of what an astronaut does on orbit is follow directions down to, mm -hmm. you know, dotting the T's or dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Um, and so we're looking for a lot of those intangible qualities about people. I think uh, having sat on the board a couple of times, right, and a lot of the astronauts are, are sitting around that table, you know, looking at you thinking, hmm, would I want to fly in space with Kayla? <laughs> or or is do am I getting vibes that right that would she'd drive me crazy. So I mean I think I think that's really can't be understated the importance of that when it comes down to the interview phase. A huge question is would I want to fly with this person? Not yeah. is this person capable of flying? Right. Would I want to fly with yeah. this person? I mean we don't we don't get really any applications from past ast right people coming in with astronaut like experience. We, as Kayla mentioned, we do a lot of the training mm -hmm. for yeah. what what they need to be an astronaut. So a lot of the intangible skills and competencies are are equally important. Hmm. Kayla, tell me about the call when you find it. You're, you're going through this interview process. You're you're saying, "Do I even deserve to be here?" But but you got selected. Tell me yeah. about the call. Um, so for me, I was serving at the Naval Academy for a couple years, kind of between tours on submarines. I was expecting to go back to a submarine to be an engineer and you know deploy a bunch more times, and that's kind of what I thought I would end up doing. Um, but at the time, I was working at the Naval Academy for the superintendent, the admiral that runs that institution. And it was during graduation week. It was the day before graduation for the senior class. So it was very busy. And we were at a formal military parade where all of the midshipmen, you know, thousands of midshipmen march onto the field in their fancy uniforms. It's a very, like, ceremonial event. And I had to participate in it because I was the admiral's assistant. So I would go out there and help, you know, coordinate the official party and all of that. And I was so nervous that I would get the call during that one time in the day where I really couldn't have my phone <laughs> because I'm standing at attention in front of hundreds of people watching this uh, parade. And sure enough, I got back to my phone right after the parade. And four minutes before that, I had a missed call. And my boss, Admiral Carter, was like, you got to call him back. You got to call him back. And I was like, sir, you can't call this number back. It's like a generic you know, JSC number is the way it shows up on your phone. I was mm. like, I think I just got to wait. And so about 45 minutes later, they must have cycled back through the rotation and called me again, because um, we knew they were going to call us on that day to let us know one way or another if we got selected. Um, and we had heard the, you know, the applicant rumor mill that if either uh, Brian Kelly BK or Chris Cassidy called you, that probably meant you were getting selected. And it, so I would, I answered the I phone. I get to make the bad phone calls. Oh, you made the bad <laughs> phone calls. Yeah, so that was uh, the rumor. So I answered the phone, and it was BK and Chris. And but of course, yeah, I got to listen in. Yeah, yeah, of course you're like, 
uh, you know, you don't want to get too excited until you actually hear the words. Um, and I just remember BK asking, Kayla, we're calling to see if you still want to come down to Houston to be a part of the next class. And it is like just the easiest question in the whole world to answer. You're just like, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but it's a pretty short call. You know, they're just like, hey, do you still want to do this? And you're like, of course. I don't know. I can't imagine anyone saying no at that point. Right. Um, but yeah, we. I was just so pumped. High fived Admiral Carter, called my husband <laughs> and let him know. And we were just really excited. Wow. And you got to be a part of that. Yeah. I get to I get to at least listen in on the good on the good phone calls too. Yeah, <laughs> you deserve that. After thanks, thanks, bad thanks. Calls. Yeah, I got I got to imagine though. Just you know, you have to narrow it down to twelve people for this 2017 class. Twelve people out of 18,000 applicants. Even just narrowing it down there, where did it, where did it go from from down to 12? Was it like 50 or something? And you went from 50 down to 12. That had to be hard just by itself. Yeah. Well, each each step in the process, it gets a little more difficult yeah. to 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 continue narrowing it down. Um, certainly, it's a multiple. There are multiple steps in the process that help us narrow this down. Uh, typically, right, multiple sets of of reviewing applications. We are we do two rounds of interviews actually. So we typically bring around 120 folks in for the first round of interviews. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we, we kind of keep squeezing the numbers. We have about generally between 40 and 50 that come back for the second mm. round. And then that gradually gets us into whatever number we're going to select. Whew, that's got to be tough. All right, let's see what we have on online. Jennifer, do we have any questions from some of our viewers? We sure do. We have one from M31 on Twitter. Can physicians be astronauts? Physicians, OK. Yes, Doctors. yes, yes. yes. Is there any type of physician that is, uh, you know, pediatrician or or internal medicine we've, or emergency medicine? Yeah, we've we've seen applications um, from a wide range of physicians. Mm -hmm. So I can't think of you know the the medical degree in and of itself, whether an MD or a DO is is qualifying. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, and, and it meets those requirements of a master's degree. It meets those requirements of science, technology, and engineering, math, yep. and of course you have to be a U.S. citizen. Yep. Okay, so Kayla, you got selected. You came to NASA. I'm sure that was a whole process of moving and, and your mm -hmm. first day and everything. Tell me about some of the training you went through. We talked about T-38 training, mm -hmm. which is in, in the plane, but what, what are some of the other things you're doing in your first few years, first few years as an astronaut candidate? Yeah, so there are basically six big areas we're training in. You mentioned T-38. Mm -hmm. We also do sort of basic spacewalk training. That's mostly done in the neutral buoyancy lab where you train underwater in a spacesuit. Uh, we also do robotics operations training, learn how to operate the robotic arm that's on the space station. We learn all about space station systems and how to operate you know, the cooling systems, the electrical systems, and how to respond when something breaks, uh, so to prepare for a mission on the space station. Um, we all learn to speak Russian, uh, which is a challenge for many of us. I, I hear think. that's one of the harder ones. Yeah, yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, some people are natural language learners, and some like me are not. Um, <laughs> but we are lucky that we have very talented and patient instructors to help us through that. Um, and then the sixth area that we sometimes don't mention, but I really think we should, is expeditionary skills training, which or teamwork training, teamwork, really. Yeah. And we we touched on that a bit earlier. Um, but I think that's just a huge, such a huge component of what we do here at NASA. You know, you can be technically qualified in a lot of ways, but if you're not able to work effectively with people from different backgrounds, if you're not able to, you know, address and move on from conflict, if you're not able to figure out how to bring out the best in yourself and others to really be a high functioning team, um, then we're really doing a disservice to, yeah. um, you know, the the whole country and world, you know, being one of yeah. these, getting this huge opportunity yeah. to work off the planet. Um, I think we owe it to everyone to be our best selves and work as a team to accomplish the mission. Now, I'm sure that takes quite a long time. Let's see if we have any questions about training online. Jennifer, do we sure. have any questions? Yeah, speaking of training, we have Anna from Twitter. How long does the training process take? Okay, yeah, how long? Um, our initial training is about two years, okay. um, and that's where we accomplish our exams in all of the areas I just talked about okay. and qualify to become astronauts. So when you graduate, you go from being an astronaut candidate to an astronaut, 
and being eligible for a mission assignment. But really, you keep training your entire time because there's a long time between your, you know, getting hired in your first mission, but also between your missions. And so we are constantly continuing to train in all of the areas I talked about so mm -hmm. that when you are assigned to a specific mission, you're ready to go and do more advanced training with your actual crewmates to get ready to fly. So what are some of the things that might be in the realm of advanced training? Like, what are you going to be zeroing in on? Yeah, so we're kind of doing basic generic skills during our astronaut candidate training, kind of just the foundation upon which we can build later. Oh. But when we get assigned to a specific mission, instead of just learning you know, generically about what's in the US laboratory module on the space station, we'll be actually practicing setting up experiments we'll do. Um, we'll be practicing more with how to do photography and um, how to operate you know, all the equipment that we might actually be using. And then our spacewalk training becomes really oh. specialized too. If there's a spacewalk planned for that mission, we'll start training those very specific procedures basically as a dress rehearsal for doing it in real life. Okay, so you're, you're mm -hmm. past the phase where you, during astronaut candidate training, you're just developing the basic skills. Now it's just when you get to assign to a mission, you can learn ex kind of exactly what you'll be doing. Exactly. So whether it's changing a battery or whether it's installing a new, um, new science hardware, you'll specialize in mm -hmm. that. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Now, you graduated recently, too. Mm -hmm. um, that was a pretty cool event to see, I'll say, just because uh, what, what's unique, for, at least for me, in a selfish way, I got to interview you guys when you came on, and then two years later, there you are on the stage, you know, graduating. How was that? Just just the event. Just, what, what did it, was it significant to you in the sense that, wow, I actually, I actually did this? Yeah, you know, like I kind of mentioned before, I think the coolest part for us was the class experience of graduating, of kind of getting to that point that the senior astronauts in the office were saying they trusted us to continue on. Hmm. And that meant, that meant a lot to us, you know, having Pat Forrester, the chief of the office, give us our silver astronaut pin, um, and Jeremy Hansen, our class supervisor, who was kind of our guide through the day-to-day -day life of being an astronaut candidate, you know, meant a lot to get to that stage together and to be on the cusp of the next phase of our careers as young astronauts. Um, so it was a big deal in that sense, and it was also a really cool opportunity really to acknowledge and thank the people who selected us, the people who supported us in training, our instructors, yeah. our mentors, and of course our families Without their support, we wouldn't have the opportunity to come here and do this amazing thing. Um, so I think for us, it was a team success and also a chance to acknowledge the people who built us up to get there in the first place. Wonderful. It must have been cool for you too, Anne, to see because you selected them and there they were on the stage. I was I was very proud. Yeah. It was a proud moment, and I was grateful to be in the audience. Very cool. Now. Do, you know, you're, I'm sure you're reflecting at this time of graduation on some of the some of the training and just what you had to go through. You talked about this diverse set of experiences, and you got to do it with some of your crewmates. You even told stories on the stage of just your time together. Do you have a memorable moment from from that two from those two years? Maybe during one of the geology trips, or maybe a particular time during one of the spacewalks or the the MBL, the neutral points. Yeah, testing. you know, there's there's almost too many to count. Like, yeah. it's such a wonderful group to be a part of. Like, I feel so lucky that I get to come to work every day and work with my colleagues in my class in the astronaut office and then in the larger NASA community. Like, everyone is here because <sighs> they're really passionate about it. People choose to work here at Johnson Space Center. People choose to dedicate their lives to human space exploration. And it's just always such a supportive and exciting team to be a part of. I think for most of us, our favorite memories from training are things that we did in the field. A lot of us think of our time on that backpacking trip with Knowles that we did as kind of a keystone experience for us um, because we already knew each other really well, but kind of working in that more extreme context of having to figure out where we're gonna get water, how to cook our food together, and just you know, traversing in the backcountry, making decisions and supporting each other, kind of seeing everybody at their best and their worst. Um, hopefully, Johnny would think it's okay for me to tell this story, but one of my favorite moments from that trip, um, we, so there's not much water in that part of Utah. Uh, a lot of times you're kind of scooping it out of these little potholes in the rock, just that like an inch thick of water, trying to fill your, 
you know, various vessels for the day. Um, so it was kind of hard to get water sometimes. But one night, it started just this torrential downpour of rain. And it was cold, and we're all huddled sort of under this overhang trying to stay dry. And Johnny's tromping around in the puddles. He's wearing <laughs> this big camouflage poncho. And I just remember looking up at him, and my, my headlamp was shining on him. It was dark. And he was using his poncho as a funnel to shoot rainwater into all the water bottles and pots and pans. And he just looked up at me with this really excited look on his face and said, Kayla, look at all this free water. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me laugh so hard because it's just like, it's in those moments where people are cold and tired and you know maybe a little bit bummed out. And seeing one of your peers, your teammates, like literally the glass is half full for him you know he's just like this look at all this free water and you're like you can think like oh it's cold terrible rain but for him he was choosing to see it from a different perspective and that's the kind of teammate you really want in those hard moments because all of a sudden everyone's laughing everyone's morale is boosted and that's just johnny being johnny you know johnny being himself and being willing to share himself with us really brought the team out of you know a tough moment and so it's things like that that you just always think about yeah, you know, you can you can say, oh, you need these team skills all you want, but it's stories that like that that really lock yep. it in. Just like when when things are really down, being able to rely on each other um, mm -hmm. and and knowing each other's strengths, weaknesses, ups, downs, um, knowing what everyone's going through. That's critical to the success of a mission because it's, it's a just great you. Story. And <laughs> that's a wonderful story. Yeah. So this is this is what you're talking about when you talk about yeah. when you talk about yeah. your 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 interpersonal skills. I'm sure that's a big part of the the interview process just by itself is just how not only who they are and understanding their background yeah. but how they're interacting with each other yeah we get asked a lot right yeah. what advice can you give somebody who's got been invited to do an interview and right again the advice comes to just be yourself right and not you're not trying to kind of fake your way through the interview process being someone you're not we're really looking for people who are genuine and real so if you know having interviewed Johnny that story doesn't really surprise me that's exactly <laughs> what I would have expected from him yeah I remember um, coming down for my first interview and we come to we came down in groups of 10 for our class yeah. and meeting all the other candidates I was just so blown away by how talented and wonderful all of them were and it's it's hard not to feel a little bit of imposter syndrome, you know, you're like, what am I doing here? Like, what did they really see in me? And kind of wondering, you know, when I go into that interview, interview room and sit at the end of this long table with all of these astronauts and senior NASA officials, like, what are they looking for? What do they want from me? And I remember going into my interview, for some reason, the last thing I thought before I walked in the door was I, was, I said, don't make any jokes. Because I was so worried I was going to say something sarcastic or oh, yeah. whatever, you know, show my sense of humor and it wouldn't be received the right way because they didn't know me very well. And I sat down and we were talking and it didn't take long before uh, Tonto, Reed Weissman, made some sort of joke at me and just instinctually, you know, that's just how you interact. He's a naval did, officer yeah, too. That's just oh, how yeah. you interact. You kind of talk trash to each other. Mm -hmm. You dished it and back. I dished it right back <laughs> at him. And there was this moment of silence and I was like, oh no, that was the one thing you weren't supposed to do. <laughs> but Don't then Chell Lindgren started yeah. laughing. Yeah. Everyone started laughing and it just relaxed me. And I just went, you know, in that moment, really yeah. quick, I was just like, you know, I'm just going to be myself. Hmm. And if that's what they're looking for, awesome, I'll feel authentic in doing it. And if not, they probably know that too, so that's okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it, that moment really helps me just be like, be a human, be myself, be, yeah. show who you Good are, human. Um, and that'll carry the day or it won't. And so that sort of healthy fatalism of just be yourself, be honest about who you are, I think goes a long way. Yeah, because when you're thinking about it, can these people work together, there's that level of authenticity that you're looking for. Because you're not looking for yeah. this facade whenever you're you're selecting an astronaut. You know, you want to know the true person because ultimately, to that story you just told with Johnny Kim, it's going to be relying on that person. So you want to know that person and who they really are, not just the facade of who they are. Yep. Let's see if there's another question. Um, Jennifer, do we have another question from online? We sure do. From Stephanie Jackson on Twitter, is there an age limit of applying to be an astronaut? That's a popular one. There is not an age limit, uh, and that includes right a, a, limit, a, a floor and a ceiling. There are, there are no limits. Um, folks need to meet the minimum requirements. Um, you know, the requirement comes in as we get down to the final group candidates have to be able to pass NASA's long-duration spaceflight physical, hmm. um, and, and provided they can do that, 
that's all good. That's that's the core. That's yep. the core of it. Not an yep. age, but just the skill set and the Correct. and the ability. Correct. Yeah, I understand. Um, now, Kayla, you you talked about this camaraderie. Um, it, that makes me think of just your class name, the the turtles. Mm -hmm. What? Why are you called the turtles? Did you name that together as a as a group? No, there is a long tradition of the class just above you oh. gives you your class nickname. So for us, the 2013 class, the eight balls, were in charge of giving us our nickname. Um, and it, it's kind of, I think, comes a bit from aviation call sign or nickname hmm. uh, tradition where there's always more than one meaning. Um, but the inspiration for the name actually came from the vice president's speech that he gave at our announcement. He was talking about how you know our families and friends had supported us in order to be there on that stage that day, and he used a metaphor that if you see a box turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there on its own. Hmm. And so that was the original genesis of the question or of the the call sign, the nickname. Because you guys didn't get there on their on your own. It was the support of everyone <laughs> around you that helped yeah. you to get to you to that point. Yeah. Very cool. And a lot of times the names have always been things that don't fly, correct? <laughs> yeah, turtles don't fly, turtles don't slow. fly, they're Sometimes slow. Sometimes they need to get back in their shell, <laughs> yeah. et cetera. Okay, so there's, a, there's, yeah. There's always a double meaning. There's always yes. a double meaning, that's hilarious. Now, um, let's zoom in on, on this class that you're looking for, and because we're talking about this next class, right? I love the stories of the 2017 class. Yeah. We, it keeps getting referred to as the Artemis generation. Let's just start there. What does that mean? What are we looking for? So uh, I'm optimistic that uh, most people know that we're trying to go back to the moon by 2024, uh, and certainly to us, that's just the next stopping point. I, I hope we're on our way to Mars beyond that. I think that's the long-term mm -hmm. goal. Um, and so Artemis are, is kind of the umbrella for the missions that will take us back to the moon. Okay. So. so is there differences that, you know, from different classes, just from thinking about International Space sure. Station crews? Are we, you know, are we talking about being together? And, and I keep going back to this interpersonal skills and getting along with each other because how I imagine this going is they're going to be together by themselves for really long periods of time. Eventually, yeah. So, right, surprisingly, what we've looked for, um, whether looking back through the shuttle selection era um, through International Space Station onto the moon and hopefully onto Mars, the skill set that we've looked for really hasn't changed that much, right? The intangible skills have, have remained pretty consistent, right? And, mm -hmm. and we've hit upon one of them extensively today, which is being a good teammate and, and understanding really what that means. Sometimes it may mean leading the team. Sometimes it may mean being a follower on the team, et cetera. Um, and so really what we've been focusing on with this class isn't really much different than what we've always focused on in astronaut selection. Okay, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. I want to zoom in on the uh, the technical aspect because I, I, I do keep going back to this theme of team aspect because I find it really fascinating. But just having a systems engineering background, having a, a nuclear engineering background, I want to understand better just the application maybe that you found in your training just you know, mm -hmm. taking your classes and going through the brutal courses of what it takes to become a systems engineer bachelor's and then a nuclear engineer master's, things that you found, the, the skills that you've taken from that that are directly applicable to some of your early astronaut sure. training. Um, you know, for me, I think my formal education in engineering really taught me how to think critically about tough problems, how to come mm -hmm. up with ideas and test them, um, and how to take in a lot of data and p parse out from that useful information upon which I could make a decision. Um, but I think for me, I'm constantly leaning on my experience in the Navy, which of course my education informed as well. Um, a submarine is a very technical, crazy, complicated machine. And whether that's working in, on the engineering side, which we all do at first, or actually more on the operation side, like driving the boat and making tactical decisions, um, I, I constantly rely on that experience because I think it's really similar to a lot of the things we do here at NASA. So that operational context really helps because that you have to understand all of that engineering equipment, mm. but you also have to work as a team to keep at the, you know everything working correctly and make really critical decisions in a time-sensitive environment. Um, and so I, I find myself leaning on those lessons of how you bring the best out of everybody to do something that's really hard. Yeah. Um, I, I rely on those lessons a lot. And the way I trained for 
that to deploy on a submarine and be successful there is really similar to the way I approach my training here at NASA. But I think that's true for all of us, even yeah. people from very different backgrounds. Like, you know, you have people who, like my classmate Jessica Watkins, who's a Mars geologist and worked um, at JPL on the Mars rovers. You know, that's that was a, she was doing that as a postdoc. It's very academic, but it's also a team working together with limited resources to try to do something incredible, right? And so she, in the same way, relies on that experience, even though it's very different than what I did in the Navy. Um, and so I think those academic experiences inform our professional experiences, sure. too, and those are also really important. Yeah. Let's zoom in on, on an aspect of that, of working in a team, because, Anne, you mentioned this. You said there's a skill of knowing when to lead and when to follow, and doing both is really critical to being an astronaut. I'm mm -hmm. sure you had to deal with this on a submarine, too, knowing when to lead and when to follow. What's that like? Is, is there a, you know, a, a mindset you have to be in of, yes, now it's time to lead, and yes, now it's time to follow? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think there are definitely times where you're going to be in a designated leadership role. That's always mm -hmm. been, you know, that NASA and the astronaut program has its roots in military aviation, so people are used to that. You know, you have spatial commanders or space yeah. station commanders, um, and they're used to that formal <clears throat> designated authority, but sometimes the hairier parts are followership and also self-leadership. You know, like, I think thinking about followership as actually being a self-leader, like, that that makes it more actionable. Like, you're, it's not my job just to follow you, it's my job to actively figure out how to support you as a designated leader and contribute to the team. And there, you know, our, our office is pretty small and we're constantly working in different roles, so sometimes I might be in charge of something even though I have very little experience, and sometimes I might be, you know, I might have a peer in charge of me or vice versa, mm -hmm. um, and being able to sort of transition very seamlessly between those roles and understand the different contexts and what that means is really important. That's huge. Now, let's let's zoom in on um, this class once again because I want to mm -hmm. take bring us back to the fact of why we're here, right? It's it's March 6th. We have until March 31st. That's correct. That these applications are open. Where do we sit right now um, in terms of ballpark applications? Because yeah. I've, I've heard it was 600 in the first few days or something. It, it was. Yeah. So that's why I don't get daily updates. So I don't, <laughs> I, don't need, I don't need to be freaked out. Uh, no, when I checked yesterday, we were close to 2,000. Wow. So, and that that's pretty normal, right? The first, the the beginning opening period, and then the end of the opening period, we typically see big spikes, especially mm -hmm. with this with the special attention on the the last day. We have a lot of people that wait to the last day to apply. I don't okay. Know why. <laughs> so. Maybe just beefing up their resume maybe, and looking maybe for that. Maybe that, yeah. that constant month to, to fine tune everything. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess there's people thinking about what it takes for, um, you know, walking on the moon, what it takes for working in teams. Um, when you're looking at a resume, you know, because all of this is going to be digital, right? Yep. We're, we're going through through USA Jobs. Yep. Is there something that pops up to you? Maybe maybe a weird skill or just some some sort of, of diverse something different um, that that might make someone pop versus another 2,000 people that you're looking at. You know, I think I think I've seen a lot of weird skills on resumes. If I'm being <laughs> honest, um, some people employ creative writing even, which is always very entertaining. Um, you know, I, again, I think that's where that hobbies and other other interests section can be really mm -hmm. informative. Uh, that's a section where, again, it needs a little bit of context. We have a lot of people who tell us, oh, I'm scuba certified. Okay, well, that doesn't tell me if they're scuba certified and that's all they've done, or have they gone on 200 dives, yeah. or, uh, you know, marathon runner. Okay, well, did you train and run one marathon, or have you run 50? I, um, so there's a lot of room in that section for people to tell us, and right, we see coding language. I remember the last selection cycle having to look up, somebody wrote that they spoke Python, and I'm like, I, I don't know what Python is. <laughs> like a it's a, co it's a coding uh, it's language. It's a coding language. But I, right, I mean, so you, you I, I've seen the gamut of things, but, but all of those things, the fact that I went and looked up what speaking Python meant, I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's interesting, I learned something. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't not put anything down that could be relevant. Interesting. 
All right, let's see if we have a case study online. Jennifer, do we have a question from some we of sure our do. listeners? Sure do. Speaking of, you know, the gamut of skills and backgrounds, we have one from Diesel from Twitter. Is NASA accepting pilot applications from pilots who have not graduated from TPS? Is weapons school graduation and test flight experience a suitable alternative? Mm -hmm. Sure. So I would, um, I'd encourage folks to read the application, but that's why I'm going off memory here. We, yeah. we added test pilot school as um, a way for pilots and others to demonstrate that they have a master's degree, right? Because basically that's extra schooling in the, mm -hmm. in the math and science arena. Mm -hmm. um, for our pilots, they are not required to have gone to test pilot school. However, uh, they they that would not they would still have to have the master's degree though, the advanced master's degree in a technical field. Hmm. So so they right. I'd encourage folks that are interested or considering whether test pilot school works or doesn't work to very specifically read um, that section of the announcement. Yeah. Okay. So definitely get the yeah. the details. There are, from there, there are a few little nuances there. Well, Kayla, what did you do to uh, make yourself stand out in terms of, was it was it maybe just oh your skills, or did you have that weird I can thing? I can answer that. Oh. I have no idea. <laughs> I remember. There you uh, go. Right. I mean, if I re recall Kayla's application being one of the first three, I think, women in the, in the submarine force. Is that correct? To kind of... Um, so I was in the first year first group. First couple, yeah. yeah that yeah, women and there were accepted that many. in the submarine force. Um, yeah, and on my on my submarine there were like between three and five of us at a time. Yeah, but yeah, it was still pretty new. When yeah, I was there. it was very new, right? Mm -hmm. And that stood out. And then I think also the direct correlation that Kayla already spoke to, with the environment of living and working on a submarine, mm -hmm. translates directly to basically the space station. If Kayla thinks of the space station as a as a flying sub, I love that. <laughs> um, I'm going to use that. Submarine in space. Submarine in space. I like it. So, I mean, right, those are two things right there that I even yeah. recall reading Kayla's resume years ago. Well, what, uh, and what are you in for for the next few months, maybe years, for looking at once the application, yep. because they closed on the 31st, your job's not even close to done. No, it's actually just starting. <laughs> uh, we anticipate, NASA anticipates announcing the next class of astronauts in and I always say the early summer of 2021. I don't know. Houston summer tends to start in March, so um, <laughs> I'm already feeling it. Yeah. May, May June-ish of 2021. Um, but as we talked about earlier, it, this is a multi-step process, and so there are things that we'll start doing from the day that announcement closes to try and you know continually whittle down the numbers and make sure that we're looking at the highly qualified folks and inviting those folks for interviews, et cetera. So. Okay. Yeah, it's about another year plus in the making. Yeah, it's going to be a long one. Yeah. Now, Kayla, you're, we're talking about the Artemis generation, hi, hiring the Artemis generation. It's also very apparent that you're part of this. You, you are the Artemis generation. Tell me what some of the folks that are applying to be astronauts, what they can expect if they eventually do become astronauts, what we have to look forward to. You know, it's a really exciting time to be starting work at NASA because we're continuing the amazing work we're doing on the space station. We just celebrated 20 years of continuous human presence there, which is incredible. Um, and we've gotten really good at knowing how to operate up there and accomplish a lot. And so we're really excited to be a part of and continue to build on that legacy. But what makes it really exciting is we have also have a lot of other things going on. We're about to bring the commercial crew program online where we'll launch NASA astronauts from the Cape in Florida, again, on Boeing and SpaceX vehicles, which is super exciting. Those will be going to the space station, so it'll be another way to get a ride there. Um, but also, we're developing all of our systems for the Artemis program, a return to the moon with the goal of putting humans back on the surface of the moon by 2024. And so that involves a new rocket, a new space capsule, new space suits, thinking about power generation technologies, in situ resource utilization on the moon, and all of these things you can really nerd out on with the people you find <laughs> around Johnson Space Center. Um, so for us, it's super exciting because it feels like we're on the cusp of a whole new mission. Um, so we're, the timing's good because you get a get to be a part of that sort of legacy mission of the space station, but also be a part of building the future of NASA, which is returning to the moon, hopefully to eventually go on to Mars, which yep. would be just so incredible. So it's a, it's a really fun time to be here. Yeah. And I know, right, there's a lot of excitement. I hope 
at, at NASA and hopefully beyond across the country to return flying U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil on U.S. rockets. So it, it's a great time That's to huge. work at NASA. Are the yeah. turtles part of that right now? Because we're building up to that. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of us have been involved in different ways in the commercial crew program. Cool. Um, some of us have been doing verification testing with them, you know, just kind of finalizing the details of their system, getting to test them out with fresh eyes and give them feedback on how things work. Uh, people are involved in operations, getting ready for those actual launches from Cape Canaveral in Florida. So really thinking through, you know, how do we get the astronauts ready for launch? How do we take care of their families? And what do we do when they land? How do we get them back to safety? Um, so there's a lot of things that are spinning back up that we haven't really been doing since the space, space shuttle stopped flying. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's, a, it's an exciting time. It's a very exciting time. We have a lot of, of I guess, new skills to look forward to, right? Let's see if we have one more question from online. Jennifer, can we squeeze in one more? We sure do. Okay. We have one from Drew from Twitter. Will current astronauts be required to do updated training to go to the moon? Okay. Well, I guess is maybe, Kayla, you mentioned specialized training. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll be part of the specialized training. I don't know yeah. if the candidate training will be updated, but... No. Well, I think as Kayla mentioned, right, the candidate training kind of focuses on the the basic Skills things that every based, astro yeah. astronaut needs to know, and then there's always mission-specific training beyond that, so. Yeah, I think a lot of the training the new class will do will be pretty similar, similar. to what our class yeah. did. Um, but as we start to fly to the moon, of course, we'll be doing specific training to include advanced geology training so that we can be ready to do some awesome science when we're up there. Uh, we'll modify and expand our spacewalk training so that we can learn how to operate correctly in one-sixth gra Earth gravity as yeah. opposed to the apparent microgravity environment we have on space station now. Lots of different tools, lots of different vehicles. You know, we have to fly a new capsule. We have to fly a lander. Um, all of this new sort of mission-specific equipment, absolutely, we'll be get doing some additional training on that. Uh, but I think it'll be more part of mission-specific training that you yeah. do after you graduate from astronaut candidate training. So if you, had a, if you had to put your name in the hat for one of those specialized training, I know what I would Ooh. pick. What would you pick? You know, I, <laughs> I really love the spacewalk training we do. And I've been helping out a little bit with the next generation spacesuit that we'll wear on the next moonwalk, oh, the Exploration cool. EMU or XEMU. Um, so I'm constantly nerding out and getting excited about those <laughs> moonwalks. Uh, just yesterday we were over in the uh, rock yard where they have simulated soil environments looking at the first generation of the geology tools we'll be using. Um, and it just gets your, your head in that mindset of standing on the moon, looking back at Earth, and collecting these samples that all inform science for decades, if not centuries, to come. Um, so it, it's definitely cool to be thinking about that stuff. That's huge. And if you had to pick one specialized training? Oh, my feet are happy on the first, so <laughs> I, I don't know. I might actually choose you, Russian. You'd, you'd be the trainer, yeah. Uh, I know I would sign up for the moonwalking. Well, Anne and Kayla, this has been so fun. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and describing yeah. the inside experience. This Anytime. has been really, really fun, and I appreciate your time. I really do. Jennifer, thanks for being our face for the, for the viewers and the listeners and taking in some of your questions. You got it. It was so nice to be with you all today. <laughs> and thanks to the listeners for actually submitting questions. They were all really great, and I think we, it really stimulated a fantastic conversation. Again, the astronaut applications are open until the March 31st, 31st. so beef up those mm -hmm. resumes and go on USA Jobs, and you can submit it there before then. And subscribe to Houston. We have a podcast. Thanks for listening.
Thank <laughs> you.